Acunetics helps thousands of organizations secure their websites and web applications across the globe. Whether you're a one-person team ensuring the security of a few websites or a large organization interested in automating your web vulnerability assessment and management, Acunetics is here to help. Hi, I'm James Boehm from Leviathan Security Group. I run the healthcare practice there, and I'm here to talk about secure application design with high data privacy requirements. So a little bit of background about me. Uh, I've spent a lot of years consulting in technology, retail, manufacturing, and of course, healthcare. And uh, most recently, before my current position, I served a little over five years as the CISO for a healthcare technology organization, where I either ran into some of the challenges that we're gonna talk about today, uh, solved them, watched other people solve them, guided other people through them. Uh, and so I think this can be valuable to folks in a number of spaces within healthcare uh, for ideas for how to build. Uh, my current clients span the range of this stuff, so I'm, I'm doing this out there pretty much all the time. Let's just dive in. So this stuff's hard, uh, and lots of people get it wrong. Uh, healthcare in particular has a lot of work to do in this space, but I think it's important to spend a few minutes talking about what we have to do and what we should do. Uh, and some goals behind this that are probably gonna look familiar to a lot of you, things like building security in and privacy too now, uh, attempting to keep things simple. Uh, they tend to wind up and get very complicated very quickly when we start building in some uh, difficult access patterns and things like that. Uh, and then setting some patterns and expectations, you know, the paved road approach that many of you have seen with uh, give, give patterns to the builders and the builders will build the right way. Uh, these can help with all of the privacy compliance regimens that we have to pay attention to here. So why are we here? I think we, <laughs> we all live in a breach centric world. I just got a no another notice this week about my data going somewhere it wasn't supposed to. Um, that leads to a regulatory response, which leads to regulatory enforcement, which maybe doesn't fix the situation and we start the cycle all over again. Uh, and we're not getting away from this. So we might as well try and at least catch up and then do some good design goals here to hopefully get ahead. And maybe the next regulation comes along and you take a look at it and say, we're ready for it. That would be the ultimate goal. So how did we get here? There are a number of regulations. They're all exceedingly complex and I've attempted to distill them down into something very, very short here. So the security rule in HIPAA talks mostly about protecting the data and not just in code and, and systems, but mostly in human actions. So it's a, it's a lot about rules for the people handling the data and to a lesser extent about technical controls for protecting the data. Uh, the privacy rule, talks about what the data is allowed to be used for, which influences the controls around who's allowed to see it and what they're allowed to do with it. And then what you have to do if you disclose it, which I think we're probably all pretty familiar with at some level. And ultimately, who do you have to notify that you've done something wrong? Uh, GDPR, Europeans have very specific rights about their personal data, and they have started to fine large numbers of euros for violations of that. Uh, CCPA, the California statute that came in last year, is very similar, uh, pertains to Californians. Note that because it's a U.S. state regulation, uh, HIPAA is explicitly uh, excluded from it. So we don't have a conflict here when we're looking at CCPA plus HIPAA. Uh, HIPAA ten generally tends to overrule. Now, if we have privacy data that is not uh, health records, and it's just personal privacy data with no health information attached, then CCPA may come into play uh, even in a HIPAA setting. And then we've got the U.S. state regulations, which there are, there are breach notifications across all 50 states. They tend to differ a bit, and there are three state privacy laws, CCPA being the key one of those, but others are starting to emerge now as well. Uh, and I'm not joking when I say it's complicated and call your lawyer. Uh, most of the response programs that I've either been involved in or participated in as a, as a third party, as the, as the recipient of breach information, uh, people don't tend to build into their incident response and breach notification plans what to do for each state. At that point, 
you really need to call someone experienced with this stuff to understand how the different regulations and maybe the different counts of affected people in each state that you may have are going to play into it. It gets very complicated very quickly. So we have to generally be able to tell users who saw their data. Now, this does not include their own accesses to that data. We might want to keep that for other reasons, though. Uh, let them opt out. This is the uh, right to be forgotten in GDPR that carries over now to CCPA. We need to absolutely not keep their data any longer than we need it. And we'll spend some more time talking about that because that's complicated and misunderstood. Uh, we absolutely need to protect the data that we have and to be able to account for where it went and who saw it when. So what we don't have to do is keep all the data. If we don't need it, there's no specific requirement, then don't keep it. First, you have to ask, is there a regulatory requirement to keep it? And often there is. Is there a business need to keep it? And even more often, there is one of those. Uh, and ultimately, is it your data? So this is where we need to unravel this just a little bit. So the regulatory requirement, speaking about HIPAA, since that's what uh, a lot of people tend to keep data for, uh, specifically talks about certain types of data that need to be kept for six years. Now, that data is mostly around uh, the actions of people handling the data and who got to see it. It doesn't mean we need to keep the data itself. And as I said a minute ago, uh, it doesn't mean we even need to keep access records for the person whose data it is. So if you run a portal where the user whose PHI uh, we're saving, uh, looks at their data periodically, that's fine. The access of someone to their own data does not need to be recorded for six years. Anybody else looking at their data does need to be recorded for six years. Business needs are a whole nother story. Uh, lots of folks uh, tend to think we want this data around just in case we ever need it. But HIPAA actually talks about data you shouldn't keep, which is that you no longer have a valid business purpose for. So if you don't have a need for processing, uh, for producing reports, for any kind of historic information for data, you should probably get rid of it. So bottom line, review what you're being asked to keep and for how long. It's more than we can talk about here, but there are some very specific categories of information you do and don't need to keep. And you should take a sharp eye to data that you might be able to get rid of and just start, start conversations across the business with, do we really need this? Can we really throw it away? You can't breach data that you don't have anymore. All right, what should we do? This is where it gets fun. So there's a famous food writer named Michael Pollan. Many of you may have heard of him. Uh, he's written about the food industry uh, over a number of years and eating trends, diet, habits, all these kind of things. Uh, and he's put together a couple of simple rules about what people should eat. So number one, don't eat anything your great grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. So don't eat really processed stuff that doesn't look like uh, the material that it originally came from. Uh, whether that might be potato chips that are perfectly symmetrical and came out of a cylinder as opposed to look like a slice of potato or yogurt that comes out of a squeeze tube. Things should look like food. Uh, number two, eat food, of course. Not too much, good idea. Mostly plants, another good idea we're learning. These seem pretty simple and straightforward and in a, just a few words there, we've captured some really, really broad topics. So I'm gonna attempt to do the same now. So. Store personal data carefully, not too much, only for as long as you need. Access that personal data only when necessary to run your business. So let's look at how we can apply these things. Some design principles. So we'll start with identity data management. Uh, this, is, this is a big one. Uh, the whole point of PHI or PII is that it's identifying to a person. And once we've identified a person, we have to protect that data differently. So one thing we can do right off the bat is we can store that identity information separately. So if we have a health record, for example, uh, we can store the identity of who owns that health record separate from the health data that talks about tests they've had or conditions they've had, things like that. It allows us to set up different access permissions 
in, in terms of when we join that data back together. The other thing we can do is we can tokenize it or assign random identifiers to it. Uh, the attribution of, of that identifier doesn't readily identify the person we took it back to. You need more information, which we keep under lock and key and only let very few people or very few programs access to um, get that information back. So limit how and when these identifying actions take place and log those actions. And then this is a critical section of code uh, involving a trust boundary that we want to test and threat model uh, and really pay close attention to during the SDLC. So some uh, benefits we gain from doing this right away are we can look at the data, most of it, and we're not instantly identifying the person back. Many of your users aren't going to need that identifying information. Uh, those that do, we can authorize an audit and pay close attention to. Uh, Forcing this model can be verified and tested, and uh, we can prohibit actions in code pretty clearly. Uh, some of the complications for doing it this way are that the, the data architecture and the code uh, get, they get a little more complicated by making this split and having to carefully rejoin the information under certain circumstances. So that's one thing we'll look at a little bit more too. Okay. Identity records. So we talked about separating personal identifiers. Uh, we can destroy or de-identify uh, the identity information. We'll talk more about what that gains you as well. And then once we have the identity separated, we need to account for its access and movement. So when it is when it is combined back up, when it is sent anywhere, things like that. Um, here's here's some interesting problems that we run into when we take this action. Now is if the identity is special and separate, um, and we sometimes remove the identity uh, from the view or from the data itself. How do we keep record of access or deletion if we don't have the original identifier in its original form with us? There are some things we can do about that, but it's one thing to keep in mind when you're designing. Another question is, should re-identification even be possible? Uh, sometimes this is a one-way street, and once you've de-identified somebody, you're never coming back. There may be other business cases where there is a infrequent need, forensics might be one of them, uh, to really establish you know, what, what data was that, where did it come from? Uh, so you'll need to look at whether you have justification or use cases uh, that require you to put that data ever back together again. And this leads us to some interesting considerations for live data access. Um, should wide swaths of your, of your audience, uh, your, your, your users, your operators, your coders, your testers, um, have access to production data? Um, why not? Uh, lots of organizations try and limit production data access use to a bare minimum. Uh, that's obviously to protect the data. Now, if we've separated the person from the rest of their data, and we're trying to troubleshoot a problem, if I don't need to see who that data belongs to, I just need to see why it's causing a side effect, I can go look at that and I'm not really looking at PII or PHI anymore. Uh, I'm just looking at essentially an abstracted record uh, of something that's you know, causing problems with my code or reporting or yeah, the, the use case I have for it for some other reason doesn't necessitate identifying an individual. So in that case, we can allow most of these internal people uh, back into the data itself. So think about that for a minute. You can provide access, just look at all your business needs to non-identity data. Uh, think about who looks at this data, whether the identity is really absolutely necessary to them, what kind of reporting and analysis you can do without having to look at individual records. And then, it becomes easier to think about those cases where we do need to identify that data back. So a customer service uh, person, for example, uh, fielding a call from the, the user whose PII or PHI we're talking about, they clearly need it. They need to identify that person and talk to them directly about it. Medical staff, perhaps, there's, there's a few cases there, uh, but it's certainly not all of your use cases. And if we can design around that, life will get a lot easier. So one way we can accomplish this separation is cryptography. Of course, we're going to encrypt the records. Uh, interestingly enough, 
HIPAA doesn't say that you have to encrypt all the records, but it does talk about having a really, really good reason for not encrypting them. So we're going to encrypt them, of course. Uh, but if there are strange uh, use cases you have that don't permit encryption, maybe temporarily uh, under certain circumstances, you may be able to justify that. Just think hard about it. Uh, in addition to encrypting the records, we have to protect the encryption keys themselves and manage uh, the cryptography lifecycle along with our data lifecycle. Uh, things that often happen in complex programs that handle this kind of information are keys either get hard coded in or other dependencies get set on them that makes them difficult to change out. In addition, algorithms, key links are the same way. They don't live forever. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, the demise of some algorithms in the past few years, and we've seen some recommendations that key lengths go up in the past few years as well. That's gonna continue, so you should plan around it. Uh, these things should be abstracted, configurable, and easy to change. Uh, for transportation, uh, you wanna keep up with all of the changes going on in TLS, uh, proof of providing that's the method you're using, which most of us will use. Storage gets a little more complicated, and we'll talk some more about that. Now, lots of people think that you can just set whole disk or whole database encryption in a managed database instance or on a storage array or something of that nature uh, and call it good. Technically, you are meeting uh, any kind of basic encryption mandate for it. It's just not very practical. Uh, it may keep an auditor off your back and get them to go away satisfied that the data is encrypted but there are just too many access use cases for that data where it doesn't help. So let's apply a defense in depth approach to the earlier we have about identity. So we can now encrypt the identity data, either table or column level. Uh, we can consider how we're going to key that data now. We could do it with person level keys. We could do it with table level keys. We could do it with customer level keys, just some organization of keying detail that's gonna make sense for the way you use your data over its life cycle. Uh, and then once we've abstracted all of the access uh, code to encrypt and decrypt it, hopefully made that configurable so that we've got uh, you know, a, a line of sight to the eventual sunset of algorithms or key lengths or things like that and the ability to change it in code, we're in pretty good shape. So about rotation length algorithm changes, uh, we know that, that these things are, are trends that happen over time. Uh, in fact, there are, there are schedules, and I'll get to those in the references at the end, that you can look at to see when you know, your favorite encryption algorithm and key length is good until, uh, according to NIST, and, uh, and when you should evaluate its use again next. Uh, the other thing here is, is that if we're not storing the keys very carefully and they get disclosed, the cleanup can be very, very painful. Uh, wanting to perform a sudden keying change on billions of records of data is not only not practical, it's gonna involve huge amounts of, of downtime and uh, a, a huge uh, kind of reaction and disruption to your business to be able to, to consider even doing something like that. If we construct an architecture where that's an extremely unlikely event uh, and where we've got some defenses to, to mitigate what happens if, if keys ever get disclosed, uh, it could be very helpful in terms of the, the, the pain that you might face under that worst case scenario. Uh, we wanna abstract all the encrypt, decrypt and, and hash operations. It just makes it easier to change things out. Uh, same thing for configuration data. We wanna make it as configurable as possible. Don't put all that in code. Don't, don't make it necessary to do any kind of an update to get that out there. And then we need to protect that configuration data just like we protect secrets. Use a key manager, use an HSM. Uh, if you're in AWS, you can use KMS. Azure and Google Compute have similar uh, key management platforms built into them. We can use HashiCorp Vault in on-prem code. There are some other ways to do that as well. But we wanna use uh, a trusted key manager that has been fully vetted, debugged, and designed for this purpose. And then we wanna use it in the manner it was designed for to basically pass requests in, get requests back, and avoid touching keys uh, as much as possible and just ask for them to be retired, rotated, things like that. Uh, the end goal for this is that no one person or group in your organization, whether it be a database administrator, a coder, uh, an operations person, has access to the entire chain used here 
to perform record encryption and retrieval. So a little bit more on key managers. Uh, when we're using a key manager, these are designed absolutely to protect keys, but they're not designed to protect millions of keys. So if we have millions of, uh, of persons, PII or PHI in our system, it's not practical to assign them an individual key and then expect the key manager to manage millions of keys. So in this case, we wanna use something called key derivation. Uh, these key managers are very good with a small number of secrets and handling rotation life cycles and key generation and all the other aspects of key management there. We don't want to ask them to do too much. So maybe if we're doing this uh, at a table level or a database level, there's a finite number of keys and it can store them just fine. If we want to store person level keys, then uh, we want to talk about something called key derivation. And this is where we compose the key on the fly and don't store it. So we're the, the, the key is basically algorithmically composed in code uh, from a combination of factors. Part of it is going to be a secret that we use that, that key manager for. Uh, part of it is going to be something, an attribute about the person or the group or customer or some other uh, division of data storage that you've got. Uh, and if we can have a unique identifier for whatever that person or group level is, combined with a secret that we've retrieved from the key manager, we can put those together, providing that we've, uh, we've got enough entropy in each half. Uh, the, the key manager is almost guaranteed to give that to you. Your person data shouldn't be sequential or reverse engineerable in any way. Maybe you want to hash it first or uh, assign some kind of random identifier uh, every time you create a new record. But once we've got those reasonably random and combined and have a sufficient length to compose a key, we put that in either directly as our key itself or we put it through uh, an algorithm like a, like, like a one-way hash to derive a key that is now used for that record. You have to be able to repeat this action. Uh, the point of not storing the key is that we can generate it on the fly without too many operations from other data we have readily on hand. And then we have the key back. This works really well if you want to go to the complexity of having person level records, even up to millions of persons in your system. You just have to have the right inputs to it. Uh, obviously it makes things like key rotation and algorithm changes just a little bit more complicated because we've got so many keys out there. Uh, the, the operation to say re-encrypt a database with millions and millions of differing keys inside of it is a whole lot more compute time uh, to do, and that's a, that's definitely a, a use case consideration for when you decide uh, to retire a particular key or key uh, composition and rebuild it. We'll talk about that more in a minute too. Uh, so again, avoid predictable patterns when you're creating your keys. They they need to be highly random, not reverse engineerable at all. Logging and accountability. So. Don't log the PI itself. That should pretty much be a given. Uh, having personal identifiers in our logs just subjects our logs to a lot of things we don't want them subject to, uh, like the kind of encryption we were just talking about. Uh, if we have derived some kind of token or internal identifier uh, for our people, we can use that to link back to the PII. Um, we need to log accesses to the PII. So if a record got retrieved for some reason, we ultimately need to be able to account for the fact that that record was retrieved by whoever retrieved it at a date and time. This is gonna drive uh, potentially investigation and forensics needs if you ever get into a breach scenario. Uh, it satisfies the need for multiple regulations to account for users about who saw their data at various points in time. Uh, but it does make things a little bit more complicated uh, for logging. And we don't wanna make logging too hard for the people who have to go into logs and troubleshoot things. So one of the methods you can use here is if we have uh, a token or internal identifier that uniquely identifies a person, there's a really easy handoff we can do. So imagine a scenario where uh, you're notified by the customer that their record is incorrect. And the customer service rep looks at it and says, yep, your record's incorrect. I'm going to have to get one of our programmers to look at this. Uh, they file a ticket, programmer goes in, 
programmer does not have access to the PII. So in this case, the customer service person instructs, hey, this record number with this unique identifier is wrong. And here's what's wrong with it, or here's what the customer is reporting what's wrong with it. So the identifier gets passed to the person doing the debugging. They don't have access to the identity at all, but they don't need it. It's been you know, the, the, the clue to the identity that they need has been given to them and they can go on and conduct their investigation. Uh, you can think about this when doing tooling, for example. Uh, you might make some uh, debug and forensic tools that rely on some kind of a handoff of identifiers. Maybe it's an input, maybe it's, you know, it's, it's brought in a list or table, a spreadsheet, something like that. And you could just put that in and start doing lookups on the data in question. The more investigative tools you have at your disposal, the easier it's gonna be to conclude an investigation, which hopefully leads to lower record counts. Record counts being an important thing here. So HIPAA in particular has a standard for de-identification itself. If you de-identify the data, it's no longer subject to HIPAA. There's two ways to do this. One is to remove all 18 of the identifiers that HIPAA defines that make a record PHI. The second is to have an expert review of your de-identification process. And this is much more involved, uh, takes a fair amount of time and can get expensive. In this case, you basically have an expert statistician with deep HIPAA knowledge, look at your process and determine whether it's good enough to avoid re-identification of that data. So if we've already taken the step of logically separating identity data, tokenizing it, some combination of those things, this gets a lot easier. Uh, we just break that link to the identity. We can do that by removing encryption keys. We can do it by making a copy of the data uh, and severing access to the identity data itself. There are a number of methods to do this. And what we arrive at now is a data set that can be used for just about any other purpose other than going back and looking up an individual person. This is one way you can meet the right to be forgotten. Uh, if you've broken in a one way direction that linkage to the person, then we've effectively been forgotten. Uh, you still have the data, you just can't ever attribute it back to that person again. So the person is forgotten. And finally on the data topic, retention. Now, too often retention and purge plans are left to be a future exercise. Uh, people look at that six year retention statute for HIPAA, don't think real hard about exactly which things in particular it applies to and just assume all of that data is subject to six years and that's a long time from now so I'm not gonna code to that, I'm not gonna think about it, I'm not gonna plan for it. Um, but it'll creep up on you pretty quickly. Uh, not only that, a lot of that data isn't subject to that retention limit in the first place anyway. Uh, so when the data has to go away, it's, it's time to have a plan for it. Now this could be simple, it could be a simple uh, you know, statement that's written in a policy somewhere that says, we're gonna deal with this when the time comes and here are the actions we're gonna take. Uh, it could be as simple as having a DBA write a sprock that gets stored off in a dark corner. And uh, when the time comes, we're like, okay, we're gonna manually run that sprock and we're just gonna wipe the data out. Uh, it could be doing the de-identification step we just talked about. Uh, it could be deleting the data. There's any number of things you can do at this point, but the key being stop holding data you don't need anymore. De-identified data itself may often have a different ret retention schedule. Uh, people like to keep historic trending information, uh, if you're in a retail space, uh, marketing loves to keep PII and spending habits and purchase habits on people. If you can find a way to de-identify that from the people and just say, you know, our population in this region likes to buy these things uh, and their trend over the last 10 years was to buy them like this, maybe you can keep marketing happy without having to go back and keep records of exactly who bought that stuff years ago. So think about things like that. Uh, first and foremost, run a good vulnerability management program. Uh, this is complicated stuff code-wise. Um, you're going to need to ensure that you've built it well. Uh, it's, it's subject to threats we don't know about yet, maybe. Uh, you're going to threat model a lot of the code. You're going to run the usual kind of tools on your code, whether it's dynamic or static analysis. You're going to subject it to all sorts of testing. Uh, you're going to keep up with the third-party libraries that you undoubtedly are using and uh, the vulnerabilities that get announced in them. So do all of those 
basic things and be able to demonstrate that, that you do them. We'll talk more about why you need to be able to demonstrate this in a few minutes. Uh, include multi-factor authentication. Uh, way too many applications in this space still do not fully support MFA. Now, which factors you use and whether they're mandatory in certain cases, there's, there's a lot of use case considerations for that. You have to think about whether, you know, if your audience doesn't all have smartphones and using a smartphone-based token isn't really a great idea. Uh, SMS is not the best MFA, but it's much more ubiquitous, more likely to work for more of your audience. You may have some cases where you can't depend on telephony via SMS or a smartphone at all, and you need some other method entirely. Uh, you may have a number of internal use cases where the user has been already authenticated through an SSO, already subject to MFA somewhere else, like a VPN maybe, or, or some other entry point, and you don't need to redo that. You may be on a mobile device where you can take advantage of uh, the biometrics offered by the device itself, uh, if you can get that to work with the rest of your code. Uh, but then you're going to have cases where not every phone is going to have them. So this, this uh, requires a lot of thought, uh, but the general rule here is do what you can, be ready for the future where you're going to have more token choices uh, on more devices in front of you. Uh, be ready for the point where you can make this mandatory by uh, introducing it as advisory first or mandatory for certain audiences first. Uh, and just be ready to have a day when MFA is the rule rather than uh, the exception or a special case. Separate your production data from your lower environments. Now, this also is kind of a basic uh, in, in the world of live data about people. We want to make sure that we don't allow production data into the lower environments. That means that if you do need to make test data out of live data, uh, you've done something uh, to de-identify or abstract it before moving it down, or you've, you've scrambled the data somehow so that it resembles nothing like its original form. Again, our, our de-identification steps can be very, uh, very useful there. Uh, we can, we can de-identify the data and then we can reassociate it with random fictitious individuals instead of the real ones down in the lower environment. Uh, we make it hard to mistakenly move the production data down. So a, a copy down shouldn't function in a lower environment. And if we're using different encryption at the environment level, at the table level, maybe even at the person level, these give us a leg up in doing this. So now if the code does, or sorry, if the data does find itself in uh, a staging or a test environment all of a sudden, and we attempt to look it up, the keys aren't going to match and the data won't decrypt. And you'll find out pretty quickly the data is wrong. So most applications that run in this space are going to be subject either to uh, an internal or external audit or assessment, uh, and often supply chain assessments where uh, your customers are demanding certain things uh, of you and they want to know a lot about this application and the protective measures it takes. So showing them that you've got a good vulnerability management program, maybe you've got internal and external uh, pen test data, things like that. Those, those are pretty standard in these, in these supply chain management exercises uh, when you go through an assessment or audit. Also, you tend to wind up answering a lot of questionnaires. And the questionnaires can be quite detailed about what they want to know. They, they may ask questions about the way you're encrypting records and storing keys. And some of the techniques we've gone over here are not so common that someone's going to immediately understand your answers if you were to take some of these uh, suggestions. And uh, they may, in fact, even lead to answering no's and columns that your assessor is expecting to see a yes in. So for that, it helps to have a write-up. So document uh, the protective measures, the data design steps you've, you've uh, performed in a couple of pages in a short paper. Uh, be able to provide this along with your assessment answers for need to know audiences. I've gone as far as creating decks for auditors where we lead them through, this is the architecture uh, that you're about to go review. These are some things that may be unusual about this or the approaches we've taken that maybe aren't so common and don't make sense to you. And here's why we did them. And here's how they protect the data. Here's why you should be comfortable with it. Be ready to be, uh, to be able to explain those kind of things to your audiences so that uh, you don't get scrutinized for not doing, say, encryption exactly the way they expected it to and maybe doing it actually far better, but just in a way that doesn't immediately make sense to them. 
risk management. If you're subject to HIPAA, you need to perform periodic risk assessments. Your vulnerability management program is a major part of that. Threat models, definitely a part of that. Uh, your remediation plans, your actions, and your priorities should absolutely be documented. You may need to provide proof of them at some point. It says, here's, you know, here's, here are the risks we saw. Here's how we assessed them. Here's how we decided to treat them and prioritize them. Uh, those decisions need to be uh, involved with business stakeholders. This is not just uh, security or technology saying, we're not going to fix that bug or we are going to fix that bug. There, there are business considerations to all this. So you want to be able to show that everybody was involved in evaluating the risks that you found and deciding how you're going to take care of them. Periodic external testing should definitely be a component. It is not necessarily required by regulation. We all know it's a good idea to involve uh, an outside tester from time to time to find things we just aren't thinking about. Finally, future proofing. So we do need to periodically review the decisions we've made here, particularly around cryptography and data retention. We're, we're making assumptions based on current day standards. They're potentially subject to change. We wanna look at this periodically. I would advise no less than annually uh, to determine are, are our algorithms now slated for sunset and we need to start thinking about replacing them. That sunset period may be one, two, three years out. That gives us time to prepare. Uh, is the retention schedule for certain types of records changing? Uh, have we hit one of those time-defined limits like six years where we should be taking action now? Uh, you want to review logs and access rights periodically. This gets relatively painful. It is mandated under HIPAA, although just not exactly how you do it. So how could be a fair amount of automation uh, involved in bringing uh, anomalous behavior uh, to eyeballs to review, but having the, the, the log process be relatively automated. Uh, you want to delegate some of your review activities, particularly around uh, HIPAA access rights out of security and audit to keep them focused on their day-to-day -day jobs. Delegate to uh, to, to managers and organizations who have the people who access these records to review their access rights and whether they're still current for everybody's job description and needs. And then finally, we have some resources here. So uh, rather than pointing folks back to the HIPAA security and privacy rules themselves, they, they are difficult to read. Uh, they're, they're written in the federal register format, which has a lot of commentary and then a very specific set of language, which is often difficult to dig out from the middle of that. I would point you instead to the Office of Civil Rights HIPAA audit protocol. This is essentially a series of assessment questions that can be answered uh, on a scale. And then you, you look at your answers. It's essentially uh, an auditor's cheat sheet. If you look at that and you're in line with being able to answer all of the questions in there regarding treatment and data handling, you're probably doing a good job, but do look at the entire list there. Uh, GDPR and CCPA, I, I point here to the statutes themselves. You'll find lots and lots of third-party commentary on them, but these are where you go to find the rule as it's written today. And then finally, uh, a lot of resources from NIST that are particularly helpful here. Uh, SP 800-66 is an overall guide to HIPAA. Now, it's not exactly a list of things you need to do here, but it is a reference to all of the other NIST standards that come into play. Uh, 800-30 on risk management, for example, and then a whole bunch of ones on cryptography down below, and 800-53 for your general security controls. And it talks in kind of a HIPAA-focused lens about how to apply those other documents, what parts of them are important to consider for HIPAA, uh, you know, which, which information is, is key here, uh, as opposed to uh, let's just apply a whole lot of things to it and we'll more than cover the base. Let's just, we'll look here to determine what do we need to really focus on specifically for HIPAA? And then the 800 series on cryptography, there's a number of standards here that talk about how to, uh, how to use different algorithms, how to use keys, how to manage keys, when to, uh, when to look at rotation periods and sunset times for different algorithms and key types. So look to those. Uh, 131A is my most useful reference here once we've got a completely implemented system. It's kept up to date every couple of years with the expected lifespan of all of the common algorithms. So we can look there and see that, you know, AES 128 and 256 are considered good for the foreseeable future. There are some other things in there that are not. Uh, if you tracked the long, slow decline of SHA-1 over the last several years, you will find in the in revisions 1 and 2 of 800-131A, their predictions about uh, when you should get rid of that, for example. So it's a good reference for, you know, are we keeping up with the times? 
And that concludes my talk. Uh, hopefully we've been uh, taking questions on the side here via the chat window, and uh, I will put up my information here for follow-up questions uh, as well. So look forward to hearing from you. If you do have questions, happy to answer them now. If they're short, send me email. If they're not, thank you very much for attending my talk. <laughs>